Well, we can't digest anything without the digestive system. So in this section, we're going to go through the different parts of the digestive system and gain an understanding of what digestive processes occur in each location of what we would call the digestive tract. Now, the digestive tract is a big, long tube that goes from our mouth to our anus. And this digestive tract, it's actually technically considered to be outside of the body. And think about it, your mouth, ah, <laughs> that space right there is technically outside of the body. And that space runs all the way through us, allowing in the center of that space, or what we call the lumen, digestive processes to occur. Between different segments of the digestive tract, we also often find sphincters. And an anatomical sphincter is something that, well, think of your anal sphincter as a good example of it. It's, it's something, it's part of the tract that's surrounded by circular smooth muscle, which means that when that circular smooth muscle contracts, it can close that area. And when it relaxes, it opens it up. So these sphincters help to section off the different parts of the digestive tract and regulate what can move from one area to the other. Believe it or not, it takes upwards of two days for material to pass from your mouth out to the other end. And the majority of that time, often a day or even more, that food material is going to stay in the colon. Um, the majority of food that you eat will have been absorbed before it gets to the colon or the large intestine, but that if food ends up in that area, that's where the majority of transit time is. Uh, the more active you are, the more fiber you eat, depending on whether you're on or off certain medications, these can all affect transit time through the digestive tract. Physical activity, um, fiber, those tend to speed up passage of material through it. So like I mentioned, the digestive tract is one big long tube, and this tube, if I were to actually cut it, I would see, and look at it under a microscope, I would see different layers of that tube, and that's what we see in this slide here. We see the various layers of the digestive tract that all face into the center space, what we call the lumen, where digestive practices occur. Okay, so one layer up, or the first layer I should say, the layer that faces the lumen is something called the mucosa, and that's where, um, a, where the various nutrients are going to have to be absorbed through in order to get to the submucosa. And the submucosa, that's where I'm going to find blood vessels and lymphatic vessels, and during the process of absorption in the small intestine in particular, that's where that material is going to enter in to those blood vessels, to those lymphatic vessels, so it can then go off to the rest of the body. One layer superficial to that is something called the muscularis layer. That's where we're going to find smooth muscle. In particular, something called longitudinal muscle and circular smooth muscle. And this muscle layer helps us basically change the diameter of the digestive tract tube to facilitate the different processes that are going on there. The most superficial layer is something called the serosa, and that helps bind the digestive tract to uh, nearby structures or other parts so it can anchor itself into place. It also provides a little bit of, of kind of fluid motion as the, as the digestive tract changes. Okay, so first part of the digestive tract, like we said, is the mouth. That's where we're going to have mechanical digestion, our teeth ripping things apart as we chew. Our tongue pushes things up towards our teeth to allow us to break them down and rip them apart. We also have chemical digestion that's occurring in our mouth through the action of saliva. So saliva, in addition to having water and an antibacterial substance called lysozyme, our uh, saliva contains two different salivary enzymes. There is a um, salivary amylase, which digests amylose or starch, and there's also something called lingual lipase, which as the name implies, helps digest lipids. By the time food leaves our mouth, it's kind of like a ball. So think about like swallowing. When you swallow food, there's usually like a ball of food that you're swallowing down. We call that a bolus, okay? The next place in the digestive tract is called the pharynx, and the pharynx is the anatomical term for the throat. 
What moves into our throat is both food that we're digesting as well as air. So what's really important is that past the pharynx, our pharynx can receive both air and food, but past the pharynx, we want to make sure that food goes posteriorly into the next stage of the digestive tract, something called the esophagus, instead of going anteriorly into our um, trachea, our, our air passageways. I'm sure we've all experienced food going down the wrong tube, and we don't want that to happen. That usually happens when we're like eating and talking or like cough while we're eating and things get down the windpipe or our respiratory tract instead. We actually have this little flap, something called the epiglottis, which helps direct food posteriorly into the esophagus. And this is basically how it works. So let's say, <laughs> let's say this is your trachea here and here's your esophagus, okay? Your epiglottis, it's this little flap here. And as that bolus of food moves down, it ends up covering over the trachea so that food can go posteriorly into the esophagus. So this video is really cool because it actually shows you a scan of someone swallowing. So you can actually see the epiglottis at work. So here we go. Let me just show you. Okay, so there's the mouth, the person's turning to the side, there's the mouth, he's chewing. Here's the epiglottis right there. And you'll notice that when he swallows, gorgeous, that food moves past the epiglottis, covering up the windpipe, covering up the trachea, so food can move posteriorly down into the esophagus. So here's going to drink some water. So cool. So cool. <laughs> And again, that material is going to move back into the esophagus instead of anteriorly into the trachea. And if I fast forward this video a little bit, it's also going to show you the process of peristalsis. So see how that food moves down like in a wave-like fashion? That's due to the uh, constriction of circular smooth muscle pushing food down. And that process of peristalsis is really important for moving things around basically all of the digestive tract. Like I mentioned, our pharynx, our throat, is a conduit towards either the trachea anteriorly or the esophagus posteriorly. We want food to go into the esophagus. And like we said before, in the esophagus is where we're going to see that movement of peristalsis that circular smooth muscle contracting behind the food, pushing it down. A good way to think of it, it's kind of like, you know, when your toothpaste is almost done and you like push it from the back. Well, think of that as like contracting muscle, pushing it forward. Okay, so that occurs in many places, but in the esophagus, uh, it's really important there. Beyond that, beyond like passive digestion that occurs there, there's minimal digestion that's occurring in the esophagus. The stomach, however, is another site of digestion and a little bit of absorption as well, but primarily digestion. But really, the main point of the stomach is to hold on to food before the small intestine is ready for it, until the small intestine is ready for it. So food remains in the stomach for about four to five hours, and your stomach is just like breaking it down a little bit further. So we have actually, what's cool about the stomach is it has a third layer of muscle, it has, in addition to longitudinal and circular muscle, it has diagonally oriented muscle. And that's what really helps your stomach churn and turn in all these different uh, orientations to help mix digesting food with the various secretions of the stomach. By the time the food leaves the stomach, it is going to no, no longer be in a bolus, but in a semi-liquid state called chyme. Okay. Something else worth mentioning about the stomach, since it's a reservoir, when food enters the stomach, I close off both sphincters at the other end of the stomach, something called the pyloric sphincter and the lower esophageal sphincter. And that's a good thing because as we're going to see in a moment, um, gastric juice is going to be very acidic and we close off the stomach when gastric juice is secreted so nothing spills up or out. Um, and which can potentially uh, negatively impact those structures. Okay, 
So the cells of the stomach, and this is actually this is actually what the stomach is, the wall of the stomach is going to look like under the microscope. This would be like, so if this is the stomach, this is the wall of the stomach, and this would be the lumen right here, okay? So all of these stomach crypts, they look like these little invaginations of the membrane, all along there, you're going to have different stomach cells. And these stomach cells are going to secrete gastric juice. These are the four components of gastric juice. Mucus for lubrication and, and um, protection. Gastric lipase, which breaks down lipids, lipe, lipids, A's, enzyme. We also have hydrochloric acid, which for the most part is going to be important for denaturing and unraveling proteins, preparing them for further digestion. And we also have a proenzyme, a not yet active enzyme called pepsinogen. And another role of hydrochloric acid is to actually take that enzyme precursor and make it into an active enzyme. So basically hydrochloric acid is really important for, for for starting the digestion of protein because it unravels proteins itself, plus it activates a protein digesting enzyme. Now we've arrived at what I like to call the business end of the digestive tract, and that is the small intestine. This is where the majority, almost all, both digestion and absorption occurs. All of those pre-structures, the mouth, the pharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, well, the the mouth and the stomach in particular, were just preparing food, digesting what they could, so in the small intestine, I could finish up that process. And the small intestine, whenever you learn about the small intestine, the first thing you'll learn is that it has a massive surface area, about the size of a tennis court, believe it or not. And part of the reason why it is so large, it has such a large surface area, is that it's really long. It's about six meters in length, although it can be smaller or larger depending on our, our particular anatomy. There are three segments of the, of the small intestine. There's the duodenum or duodenum or duodenum, depending on how you call it, the jejunum and the ileum. Okay, the duodenum, you can't even release, oh, here it is. This is that first part of the small intestine. The second part is the jejunum. And then the third part, more or less there, is the ileum. And quite honestly, there's, there's very few differences between them that you could see with the naked eye. You can only really differentiate between them under a microscope, and that's beyond our purposes. Okay, so first of all, small intestine really long. Plus, if I were to look within the small intestine um, tube, within like within the lumen, I'm going to see these like folds. I'm going to see, and you can kind of see them here, like right here, there's a circular fold in that area. Here's another circular fold as well. And that again contributes to its surface area. So here if I have a, my circular fold, if I were to just flatten that out, I would notice that my surface area is already quite a bit larger. If I were to take that small intestine and again, take a cross section and just look at it like that, this is what I'm gonna see. And what's really cool in there is if you just look at the small intestine with the naked eye, it looks flat, but what you actually have along that wall are all of these invaginations of the small intestine wall. These are called villi. That's a villus right there, villus singular. And villi, these are the functional units of the small intestine. Each villus is going to have absorptive um, vessels within it. So basically in the small intestine, when I have nutrients here in the small intestine, as we're gonna see in a bit, they have to pass through the mucosa of the small intestine to enter the center of that villus where it's going to find a blood vessel or a lymphatic vessel which it can be absorbed into. In addition to all these uh, villi, large circular folds, large surface area, something else that increases the surface area of the small intestine, which are really hard to see on this slide, are something called microvilli. So the microvilli, it's like if I took this and I just created more villi all along it. So if I were to look at a small intestine cell, I would, under a, like a really awesome microscope with great magnification, I'm gonna see these little projections from the small intestine cell. 
And these not only increase surface area, but these are responsible for secreting some of the um, digestive enzymes that the small intestine secretes. Under a light microscope, these microvilli, it's again really hard to see on this slide, but they, they look kind of fuzzy, almost like a brush stroke from a paintbrush. And because of that, the microvilli are collectively called the brush border. So when we talk about brush border enzymes, these are enzymes secreted by the microvilli of the small intestine. So again, here we have our villi, collectively villi, and individually our, our singular villus. Different nutrients use different absorptive processes to move across the mucosal wall, okay, the, where there's these cells, and enter in to those uh, vessels that allow them to travel around the body. So water uses a process called osmosis, uh, lipids and fat-soluble vitamins. They use a process called passive diffusion. They just kind of move past the, the phospholipids of the, of the small intestine cell membranes. Um, however, our sugars and our amino acids, they're going to use something called a protein transporter. Okay, and these proteins are kind of like embedded in the membrane of these cells and they provide a, like a tunnel that these nutrients can get absorbed through. Uh, glucose and amino acids also need energy in order to be absorbed, and that's why they get absorbed by, through a process called active transport. So after the small intestine, whatever's left over is going to then move on into the large intestine. And the large intestine, like we said, that's where the, the material spends the most amount of time. The large intestine is about one and a half meters in length, and the main part of the large intestine, all the way here to here, is called the colon. Okay, and the colon's divided into the ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid colon. That's like where the main business of the large intestine takes place. Basically, our goals in the large intestine is to prepare material for excretion. So remember that in the small intestine, basically after material leaves the stomach, in the small intestine, food is in a semi-liquid form called chyme. But that's not what you're going, what's going to end up in your toilet. We want more of a solid form that's going to be easier to pass. So one of the missions of the large intestine is to suck some of that water, absorb or reabsorb, I should say, water out of that what was chyme in order to compact it in a way that's easier to pass. Another really cool thing about the large intestine is that's where I find the majority of um, the non-human cells that are collectively known as something called the microbiota. The microbiota, these are all these like organisms that live along with us in our body. So some can be viruses, but the majority of them are bacteria. Usually when we talk about the microbiota, we're talking about bacteria. And there are, and this is mind blowing to me, 300 to 500 different species, not total amounts, but species. We're one species. You and I were one species. There are 300 to 500 different species of bacteria just in our micro, microbiota, okay? Collectively, this is also sometimes called uh, the microbiome. And this basically means that we have all this, since we have so many different species, each of these species have different genetic material. So in addition to our own genetic material, we also have all this genetic material from all these different organisms that are living alongside of us in our body, okay? What do the microbiota do? Oof, we're still trying to figure all of that out. Some of its roles are very clear. We know that they're important for vitamin synthesis. They help with the synthesis of vitamin K, vitamin B2, and vitamin B12. We also know that they help ferment certain uh, types of fiber and help to get some extra, basically, calories out of those as well. We also know, and we're learning more, that they have a role in both health and disease. And honestly, we are still conducting lots of research on this matter, and we're still trying to figure out exactly what population of bacteria is maybe healthiest. Um, 
but we're not there yet. And this is going to continue to be a really interesting area of research as we figure out just how important this micro, uh, microbiome is to our overall health. In addition to these primary structures of the digestive tract, we also have accessory structures as well, the liver, pancreas, and gallbladder, which I'll talk about in the next video.